Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the SCSA's Webinar Wednesday. I'm very pleased to let you know that we have a special guest speaker today. Uh, but first, just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Once the presentation has concluded, we'll have some time for a brief question and answer period. So I would encourage you to take the opportunity to ask questions during this time. If you're watching through Zoom, you can send your questions through the Q&A function of Zoom. <clears throat> And if you are watching through Facebook Live, we have one of our advisors monitoring Facebook and will submit questions from there into the Q&A function <clears throat> of Zoom. So now I would like to thank our guest presenter from the Saskatchewan Health Authority, who has taken time during this extremely busy period to present to us today. I will now pass it over to Sheldon. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. I'm gonna share my presentation here for you and we'll get going here. Here we go. So <clears throat> thanks for guys. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, so basically, uh, I wanted to just share some thoughts with you on, on the profession of my profession, but also how my profession can hopefully help your profession and pass on some, some knowledge. So who am I? I'm a respiratory therapist. Uh, I'm also a certified respiratory educator. So I moved here from Newfoundland back in 2002 after graduating. I, I worked for about a year in a kid's hospital in Newfoundland. I moved out here with a, a fantastic two-year plan to move back east and, and take over the province. But uh, I, I met my future wife and uh, here I am. I'm a lifer now here in the prairies. So my experience is actually quite broad. Um, I, I used to spend a lot of time in the emergency room, surgical intensive care, as well as medical intensive care. Uh, for those of you who can remember, we usually have a we used to have our pediatric intensive care here in general uh, in Regina at the general hospital as well. And most of my time has been actually in the neonatal intensive care unit. Uh, I've also been a member of the pediatric and the neonatal transport team. Professionally, I'm, you, I was a past, or sorry, I am a past president of the Saskatchewan College of Respiratory Therapists, which is our governing body here in the province, which allows me to be registered. And my present role is student and interprofessional respiratory educator for the SHA in the Regina area. So what do I do? Well, nobody seems to know what I do for a living. My, uh, my mom still questions exactly how I make money and, and how do I benefit the people. So this is a meme from Facebook, but to be quite honest with you, it's really not that far from the truth. I, I do a little bit of everything. Uh, in the, if I start in the top left, I do help people with their breathing. That sounds silly, maybe, but yeah, just everyday breathing. The gentleman in the left-hand corner here had surgery, so now he's actually breathing in through an incentive spirometer, which helps his lungs open and, and stops them uh, from collapsing and causing pneumonia. And I'm going to show you some pictures of that. What nursing thinks I do? Well, I used to be a shift worker, yeah. So yeah, there were a few naps in between jobs for sure. My patients think all they care about is smoking. Ah, I do care about smoking. It's a big thing, and I'm going to touch a little bit on that, too. Society thinks I'm the guy who pulls the plug. Uh, as crappy as that sounds, I actually do that, too. Okay, Pulling the plug is kind of a derogatory term, in my view. But my resume says that I initiate, maintain, and discontinue ventilatory life support. So that is a part of my job. I like to think I'm a little bit more analytical when I'm looking at chest x-rays and, and different diagnostic tools. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that too. And what I actually do is kind of a jack of all trades. If someone needs an airway, I'm the guy putting it in. If someone needs uh, some help with their breathing in any form or fashion, I'm that guy also. So here I make my living, I suppose. So, so the highlighted areas, what we're going to talk a little bit about, I'll try not to get in too gross of stuff because it is lunchtime. You guys might be snacking on your lunch as we talk about this. But at the end of the day, if I go down through my breathing tube or my trachea, we're going to talk about this little area down here. So our lungs actually have breathing pathways all throughout our lung which come to these little cluster of alveoli. Think of grapes, for example. So we have a cluster of grapes surrounded by blood vessels. We breathe in, as we breathe in, oxygen is gonna fill one of those clusters and CO2 or carbon dioxide is gonna come out. This is a single 
gas exchange unit. So this is what the lungs are made up of. There's 300 million of these inside of your lungs. Basically what we're gonna care about is the air pocket itself, the blood that's coming in to pick up that oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide, and this little selective membrane that's actually keeping the two separated. It allows gas to transfer back and forth from the blood into the air and in from the air into the blood. And uh, it's extremely important into everything that you do on day-to-day -day living. We're gonna talk a little bit about that too. So three basic things that we're gonna probably spend this afternoon talking about, okay? So prevention, recognition, and diagnosis. So what is prevention? So prevention is exactly what you guys think about quite a bit in your day-to-day -day living. And for me, it's how is my body protecting me and how can I help my body? So we'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. Recognition. Do you know when you're actually having breathing problems? Is it just a bad day? What's going on? So when should I actually see my doctor? And how can myself, my professional teammates and, and doctors test to see what's wrong, if anything's wrong at all? And we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to talk about diagnosis. Well, I just want to show you some examples of disease process, which actually might be pertinent to your guys' career and your line of work. And then I have a pig lung demo that I actually have some clips of, and, and we'll, I'll show you that too. So as silly as it sounds, prevention actually does start right at the tip of your nose. How does our body take care of ourselves? This guy has some beautiful nose hairs and, uh, you know, in today's world, that would probably be looked upon, frowned upon, but uh, actually those little nose hairs are his first line of defense for every breath he takes. The nose hairs are actually going to filter out big debris. It won't get into your airways. If we take the entire upper airway, which is basically from your vocal cords up, all this area in here is something that I am very passionate about in my day-to-day -day life. And I hope, can, hopefully can convince you guys to be a little bit more aware of what we're doing. So obviously this is a cross section of a head. Here's the nose right here. We actually see the teeth and the tongue. So how does the nose help us with our breathing and keeping us healthy? Well, what the nose is actually doing here if you see these membranes in here, there's actually three of them. And on each side of these membranes in behind your nose, this cavity here actually filters, heats, and humidifies the air you're taking in on a day-to-day -day basis. Breath by breath, that doesn't really matter too much to us in July and August here in the prairies. There's so much humidity and the heat here is fantastic. Something Newfoundland didn't have. But this, uh, this is counterintuitive to anything that we're gonna face in January, February. At the tip of your nose in January, the temperature could be minus 40. By the time it hits your middle chest, it's actually up to plus 37. So you can imagine how much work of breathing your body's putting in to heat something up to that capacity in a half a second or less. The humidity in the air in January is also like probably 22 to 24% we're gonna 100% humidify that as we pass over this area. And by the time we get to the mist, it's actually gonna be 100% humidity. So if there's one point I want you to take away from today's lecture is the fact that humidity, water is extremely important, okay? <clears throat> water is, is what's gonna keep us alive uh, for sure and it's gonna keep us healthy. So point number one, make sure you drink lots of water. So how do we, how does this protect us? So our tongue is right here. Tongue really doesn't aid that much in the protection of airway, but I want you to come down here and take a look. This tube is our esophagus or our food tube. This tube right here is our trachea or our breathing tube. And they, they live side by side. So the question always I get is how do I chew food? And it knows where to go. Well, right here is the vocal cords. This little slit right here is the vocal cords. And this guy right here, labeled A is the epiglottis. This is like a trap door. So what this trap door does is as you swallow, this trap door will close off this area right here and your food will go down the right way. If you've ever swallowed water or anything and it actually makes you choke and, and a very common statement is, oh, my food or my water went down the wrong way. This is where it went right here, okay? So <clears throat> you can actually feel your epiglottis close. Now in COVID times, if you're sitting on side of somebody, don't do this. 
but slow down, give yourself a cough and slow down your cough. And you can actually feel your epiglottis close to protect your airway. And by slowing down your cough, I mean, <clears throat> so you actually close off your airway and that's a mechanism of protection of your airway. So what does the epiglottis look like? Okay, sorry for eating lunch. But anyway, these are your vocal cords right here, okay? This is the epiglottis. This is that little trap door that's going to fold over this hole. You can actually see how it hinges on here. And that's what's going to keep that nice and closed when you're swallowing your water or swallowing your food. Another way that we're going to protect our body is sea anemone. Well, not quite sea anemone, but the lining of your lungs on the picture on the right, this is what the lining of your lungs look like. So these are called microcilia. So what does microcilia, how does that operate in the function of, of protecting me? So kind of like these fish here sitting in the sea anemone, we need water in order to keep these cilia moving. Now, <clears throat> this demonstration, I know it's kind of juvenile, but it really does prove a, a very fascinating point for me is that these little cilia, as they sit on the cells of your lungs right here, they will actually bring debris from the bottom of your lungs all the way up to the midpoint of your lungs where it allows you to cough them up. So again, another important point for keeping a nice level of humidity or water in your body, drink lots of water. If we do not drink water, you can see over here, it slows that stuff down. Any debris that we accidentally do breathe in, it's going to sit there and your secretions are going to get really thick. Breathing is not going to do so well. And if you take a look at all this mucus over here, it was just moving up the chain. This escalator is passing it out and we cough it out. Down here, this mucus tends to hang out. And the longer it hangs out, the more difficulty it is to move. As days progress into weeks, this is where pneumonia can come from. So really good hydration is fantastic for lung health. So keep drinking that water. As I mentioned, the water is extremely important. If you take a look down here, your lungs are actually made up of 90% water. The tissue of the lung is very, very soft and spongy, and it's not very thick at all. And uh, again, I can show you some the picture of the pig lungs coming up, and you'll get a better idea of just how important the water is. So point number one from today, drink lots of water. Uh, again, COVID times, flu season, you guys have heard this up the yin yang. My kids are tired of telling me or of hearing me tell them, wash your hands. It's going to keep you healthy. It's going to keep your family healthy, uh, friends and coworkers and loved ones around you. It keeps everybody healthy. So frequent hand hygiene for sure, uh, quite beneficial. People tend to think it's not that big of a deal. It is a huge source of infection in the hospital. We actually do monthly audits uh, secretively to make sure that staff members are in fact washing their hands. And there are correct ways to wash your hands. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. You guys can look that up. But I keep telling my kids, sing happy birthday to yourself in your head. That's how long it takes you to wash your hands. Exercise. This handsome young man right here, he's doing some big ass work right here. Okay, so we're lifting lots of weights. The premise of this slide uh, is me doing exercise, but it doesn't have to be weightlifting. It can be any movement whatsoever. The important part is actually nice, heavy breathing, get that heart pump and get the lungs working to their full functional capacity. And this certainly keeps your lungs clear. It keeps them clean. And, and if you do have any debris down there, this will certainly trigger that movement because the first thing we all gravitate to when we're exercising is water. We're going to take some more water because we're hot, we're dehydrated, and we're going to start moving those secretions. Overkill on the water, but you can't do it. You can't overkill on it. It's, it's fantastic for what it's going to do for you. Keep exercising. I think Health Canada is telling us 160 minutes per week. Now, you can make that work however you want. Daily exercise is obviously better for you and better for overall lung health. Flu season. 
get your flu shots. Um, I know some people don't feel great about immunizations and that's their own prerogative, but flu shots have been proven to work scientifically year after year after year. There have been some bad years where the flu shot didn't work, uh, but for the most part, it is something that's very beneficial, keep you healthy, keep you out of the hospital. So I would certainly recommend getting your flu shot. This being the year that we're living in, 2020 hasn't been kind to us. This would certainly be the year to get your flu shot if you haven't. Uh, everyone in my house gets it. My wife and I both work at the hospital. And because of the risk that we put on our children, our children also get it. But if you are over the age of 65, I would highly recommend it. SHA would recommend if you're over the age of 40, you should get it. And quite honestly, all adults should get it and even children. PPE masks. So this is obviously a big deal. So this is kind of what I'm talking about. So our body is protecting us up to a certain extent, but our body can't protect us against everything. And, and COVID-19 is certainly proof of that for sure. And you're the type of industry that you guys are involved in. This is going to be some of the material that you're used to seeing. So the respirators on the top, these are considered N95. I'm sure you guys are probably familiar with N95. That's what I need to work. Okay, so these are the level of security that I need when I'm actually visiting patients. Uh, a couple of years ago, we actually hooked up with a system similar to this because we actually had an outbreak of Ebola uh, in Africa. And again, because COVID-19 has proven to us that people do travel all over the world. So we were prepping for a possible Ebola patients. And so we've all, all of our RTs have received training on this type of unit also. The other respirators with the external filters, I'm assuming that would be something that, depending on uh, the type of job you guys have in construction, that would be something that you guys would be using for sure. And make sure that you wear them properly. Uh, as cool as these masks might look and they're gonna save you, if they're not put on properly, they're actually a detriment to you. Uh, you think you're safe and you will put, your safe, put yourself in unsafe situations thinking that you're protected. If the seal is broken or not actually put on properly the first time, if the straps aren't tight enough, if you have a small crack in the side, it's off or not. Uh, so make sure that you inspect your PPE, make sure that you put it on the same time, or sorry, the same way every time, and make sure you do a seal check and go through your verification processes. And of course, it's Halloween, so if you wanna scare the crap out of your kids, that's my game. So how do we recognize what's wrong? <clears throat> so basically I wanna talk about a couple of things that can make you see, you know what, maybe it's time to go see a doctor. Um, the clip on the right actually I, I thought was quite interesting. This actually came out about two years ago and this caused quite a stir in, in my community because this is as horrible as it may look, this is quite fascinating. We only get to see lungs the way we see lungs is after death. So post-mortem, we can actually take a look at someone's lungs. This, is, this person here was actually had internal bleeding and their lungs actually filled with blood and it clotted. And of course, if you can imagine that that airway now is completely blocked, they weren't moving any air. They weren't able to take oxygen in. They weren't able to get carbon dioxide out. So after this was actually coughed up uh, by a patient, it actually came right out of their lungs and the blood clot held the exact same shape as the entire right side of their lung. So this would be the airways, right? And if the airways are blocked with blood, this guy uh, wasn't breathing that well. So this is from the American Lung Association. I actually have six warnings and I copied them word for word. Um, I didn't put any of this stuff in my own words because I do think that it's extremely important that people need to recognize what are six potential warning signs and when should I actually seek some medical help or a medical opinion. So a chronic cough, a cough that you have had for eight weeks or longer is considered chronic. This is an important early symptom that tells you something is wrong with your respiratory system. So for example, um, what can I use? Asthma, not necessarily asthma, but uh, like if we think about allergies. So seasonal allergies, people get stuffy nose, eyes, and they may have a develop a cough. 
you obviously know yourself if you have seasonal allergies and you already know what your problem is. You actually may be kind of worked up uh, breathing wise for a couple of weeks. And then once the season settles out, you settle out. If this prolongs for eight weeks, well, maybe it wasn't seasonal allergies. Maybe this is something else that I need to look into. Shortness of breath, it's not normal to experience shortness of breath that doesn't go away after exercising or that you have after little or no exertion. Labored or difficult breathing, the feeling that is hard to breathe in and out is also a warning sign. So if you're having shortness of breath just with routine practices like going up a flight of stairs, maybe it is a physical fitness thing. It may not be a physical fitness thing, okay? So if you were short of breath, just getting up from the kitchen table to, to put your dishes in the dishwasher, very, very day-to-day -day tasks, your shortness of breath actually may be related to something a little bit other than, than just physical fitness. Number three, chronic mucus production. So mucus, also called sputum or phlegm, is produced by the airways as a defense against infections or irritants. If your mucus production has lasted a month or longer, this could indicate lung disease. So I showed you that little escalator demonstration, the mucus comes up, you clear your airway. If your mucus becomes a lot and you're coughing a lot of this stuff up on a day-to-day -day basis, first thing in the morning is quite common. This actually could be a bad indication and something you should probably get looked into. This may sound a little gross, but even the color and consistency of that mucus can certainly give us some indications of what you could be dealing with. And uh, that's also important to share with your physician. Wheezing, noisy breathing or wheezing is a sign that something unusual is blocking your, your lungs, airways, or making them too narrow. So if you're familiar with asthma, that's the sound that asthma makes, okay? So we hear wheezing, we tend to think asthma but asthma is usually diagnosed in childhood. So if you're an adult and all of a sudden you just develop this sudden onset of wheezing, again, another warning sign that you should probably dig a little deeper and see what's going on. Coughing up blood. I don't know how much I'd actually need to describe that as being a warning sign. I think that one's pretty self-evident. But if you are coughing up blood, it may be coming from your lungs or upper respiratory tract. Wherever it's coming from, it signals a health problem. So you're playing hockey and you take a stick or a puck to the face and you start spitting blood. Well, I think that's rather evident of what caused it. But for no reason at all, if you start coughing blood, it is certainly something to look into for sure. And don't take it for granted that it just might be something internal in your mouth. It's probably coming from something deeper. So just be aware and think about where things are coming from. Chronic chest pain, unexplained chest pain that lasts for a month or more, especially if it gets worse when you breathe in or cough, also a warning sign. Um, I, I, I used, when I gave a presentation similar to this, I used to pick on men because uh, we tend to be very prideful and, and sit there in silence sometimes if you do have chronic chest pain. Uh, that's no longer the case. Uh, I think it's pretty even among the sexes these days that uh, we, we tend to think the absolute worst when we have chest pain. The things that feel the worst can quite easily be treated sometimes. Unfortunately, the longer you wait, the more difficult uh, the treatment actually may be or the results might be even worse. So again, if you're experiencing that for a month and you have no idea where it's coming from, uh, again, something to take a look at. If you were body checking a hockey game and you have a sore chest, well, you probably know what's causing that. But if it's hanging on for a month, we should probably dig a little deeper into that. How is your physician going to help you once you've gone through these signs and symptoms? And what are we going to look for? Well, probably one of the first tests we're going to look at is chest x-ray. This is a very normal chest x-ray. Air is dark. Bone isn't. It highlights quite nicely. And you can actually see the heart in the middle right here. Okay. But all the dark areas within this area are actually air. So the lungs are actually taking in lots and lots of air. These little areas that you're seeing in here are just huge areas or, or collections of blood as the blood takes oxygen from the lungs and delivers it back to the body through the pump of the heart. Another test that I do, uh, the RTs or respiratory therapists, they will do arterial blood gas. So most people have in fact given blood um, by venous puncture, probably up in the crease of your arm if you're getting blood samples. That comes from a vein. We're actually gonna take blood directly from the pulse. 
The pulse is the final endpoint of fresh oxygenated blood that just got oxygenated by the lungs and then pumped out by the heart. It gives us a fantastic indication of how much oxygen is in there and we have normals and we know how much carbon dioxide is in there. So again, we have normals and if it deviates outside of that, it can give us an indication that we may need to investigate further. Uh, it's a very simple test. It takes like two minutes. Uh, it does burn a little bit, but it's not bad. And uh, it's actually helpful in uh, helping us diagnose. This is probably common in people who actually work in the mining industry. Uh, spirometry is a very common respiratory exam. What we actually do is we have you sit in a, an enclosed box. And with nose clips on, we're going to get you to breathe different patterns. We're going to get you to breathe at different strengths, different depths. We want to know exactly what your lungs are. Based on height and sex, we can actually take a look, and ethnicity, we can actually take a look and see what your volumes are and what your pressures are and exactly where they would be in the normal scheme of things. So then we're going to do comparisons. Also, if you take a look at the graph at the right, we can actually see the fact that some of our flow volume loops, they're going to have normal or they're going to be obstructive or restrictive. And again, that's going to be dependent on what environment you've been in and it can actually give us some indication on how to treat things. We also do exercise tolerance. So with this, we're going to put you on a treadmill or a bike and we're going to measure you breathing. We're going to measure the oxygen in your blood. We're going to measure your blood pressure. So we're going to get a, another better indication on what the average person, your height, weight, sex, ethnicity, what they would be doing compared to what you're going to be doing. We also have CTs. So you're familiar with CT or CAT scan. So basically what we're doing is looking at the lung tissue itself. So again, just like the chest x-ray, air is dark uh, and the other tissues are highlighted very nicely. This is a normal lung, okay? So the highlighted areas in here are actually blood, okay? The blood is going out to those little alveoli that we talked about to pick up carbon dioxide and deliver oxygen and, and bring it back. All the air that you see is actual airways. If we take a look over here, this patient actually is positive for silicosis. And we're gonna talk a little bit about silicosis in a few minutes, but you can actually see that the airways and even some of the blood paths themselves are actually blocked with nodules. So to, this helps us get a comparison of what a normal person would look like versus someone who's actually experiencing some breathing trouble. And then we have a more invasive uh, procedure called bronchoscopy. So bronchoscopy basically is a lighted camera that we are able to put into your airways. It's going to go down through your breathing tube, through your vocal cords right here, and into the upper segments of the lungs. We can't go too deep with this. As you imagine, this actually gets quite small. But through this little camera and device, we actually have brushings. So we can actually scrape the inside of your lung and get a better idea of what kind of cells we're dealing with. We can also do a biopsy. So we can actually pass some very microscopic forceps down through the hole of the camera and take a little bite of the inside of your lung tissue and send that off for pathology. And again, have a better idea of what kind of condition we would probably be looking at. So diagnosis, what are we dealing with? Well. I guess the most important part here that I have to make is probably point number two, if you take anything away from today's presentation, don't get caught up in Dr. Google, okay? Uh, it's, it's, it's a very long-term issue that we're dealing with. Uh, we know that the ease of the internet is fantastically, it's right there at our fingertips, okay? I have a pain in my head, okay? so. I have a brain tumor. It's obvious I have a brain tumor because I've looked it up on Google, right? It could be the fact that I probably didn't sleep well last night. Maybe I'm dehydrated. Maybe I had one too many glasses of wine last night. Who knows? So be very, very careful when you're on the internet looking for which ache or pain or symptom is going to link up to what you want. Probably the best example I can give today is COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19 to date has roughly a quarter of a million tests done in this province. 
So we've cast, we've tested over 250,000 people in this province. And I think the numbers that we've had are probably less than 6,000. I mean, it could be off on that one. So people think they have COVID because they have cold or flu-like symptoms, which is very similar to what COVID would be. So be careful what you're looking at. And again, seek professional help. Point number three I need to make, I wouldn't be doing my job as a respiratory therapist if I, if I said to you, if you smoke, please consider quitting. Uh, if you don't smoke, thank you. Your body thanks you. Smoking can lead, among other things, but it can lead to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. You guys would probably see it in the media as COPD. And COPD offers a broad range of, of uh, lung an anomalies that we need to deal with. The list on the left here shows you the kind of things that you're actually going to be dealing with. But the, the pictures on the right, I do believe, actually tell a better picture. So chronic bronchitis can certainly be a side effect of smoking. And what it's going to do, it, it's actually going to cause your airways to narrow in. So if you take a look at this side over here, we have nice normal airways. So these are the pathways leading to the alveoli that I talked about. So around here, you can actually see pink muscle. The muscle gets tight and constricted, very little air getting through. Over here, we have excessive mucus production. As we talked about earlier, it's, it's not conducive to nice, easy breathing. The other, at the end of these airways, of course, is that we have our alveoli down here. Okay, so emphysema basically is the destruction of all these walls. Well, how is that important? Well, in order for us to get good gas exchange, oxygen in, carbon dioxide out, each one of these alveoli are wrapped with blood vessels. If we start taking away the walls, we actually open up so much surface area. We lose surface area. We're losing um, the ability to, to get oxygen in and get the carbon dioxide out because we have less surface area to make that happen. So this is the anti-smoking speech that I have to give. And uh, people think, yeah, you know what? I could get cancer. There, there's just, cancer is just one of the things that smoking can cause. So please consider not smoking. I enjoyed preparing for this presentation because it made me go back to the books a little bit. Silicosis is not something that I'm extremely familiar with. It's not something that I see in my day-to-day -day work because again, I do most acute care, things that are needed to be done right now is probably the premise of my work. So silicosis became really interesting when I was preparing for this. I know what silicosis is and I think you guys do too. That It's basically you're inhaling the dust from the area that you're working in, typically silica, but it could be other uh, airborne dusts also. So what happens to the silica dust is that as you inhale it, and as you can see over here in the little graph, it just sits there in these little globules or our alveoli, our air exchange units. The, sil the, the silica dust itself is not the problem. What happens is that your body wants to fight that. Your body wants to protect you. So it starts to attack that. And unfortunately, it's actually causing scar tissue on the inside of that airway. And if we have that little thin membrane between the air and the blood, if that gets scarred, it doesn't allow for good gas exchange. What I found interesting about silicosis was the fact that there's more than one type, which I have to admit, it's been 20 years since I went to school, I kind of forgot. But if you're new to an industry, you can actually get acute silicosis just after a few weeks of exposure. So going back to our masks and our PPE, talking about the importance of that and how big of a deal it actually is to wear the proper mask, because you could actually have a chronic cough, weight loss, sharp chest pain, breathlessness, and tiredness just after a few weeks of being, this, being exposed to this. We also have the chronic side, 10 to 30 years exposure, and obviously the list on the right, the inflamed lungs and so on and so on, not comfortable, not anything that's gonna make you feel like you wanna get up and go to work today or get up and do some exercise, it's, it's not really there. This is the scary one right here, the accelerated ciliosis, silicosis, sorry. Within 10 years of frequent silica exposure, swelling in the lungs, swelling in the chest, lymph nodes, and difficulty breathing. 
all three of these are quite serious. Uh, and I think we can remedy it with proper PPE and, and wearing your, your proper mask. This should be eliminated. So familiar, similar to silicosis would be actual coal mining. Okay, so this is coal dust. So I know this picture is actually quite old, but if we take a look at this healthy tissue versus a 90, 90 year old school teacher versus a 40 year old coal miner, okay? This dark area here is all fibrotic. And what fibrotic means is that there's no elasticity left in the airways, okay? As you sit here now and just take a normal breath, breathe in, relax. When you relax, the elasticity in your lungs just, it just forces the air out. You're not doing that over here. There's no elasticity left. So the fibrotic, fibrotic tissue takes that away. So again, if you take a look at my picture over here, you can actually see our guy wearing his proper PPE and how important that actually is. So I did mention earlier talking about seasonal allergies and you can actually see the, the, the dust or the pollen coming from this plant. That's not what I really wanted to talk about. What I wanted to talk about was the picture itself. Take a notice of how that pollen is just in the air, okay? If you are a seasonal allergy sufferer, you know what this looks like and feels like in the spring of the year. In the construction industry, there are different ways that we could be experiencing that. Hantavirus is a very, very scary disease. Um, it's, it's not something that we're going to see every day. We, we, are, we, manage, we do typically see two to three cases per year in this province. If it's caught early, it is very treatable, but it's a very fast moving virus. And unfortunately it does result in death more frequently than it should. So in the construction industry, it would, this would be involved in the cleaning up process. So as you're moving, dusting, whatever the case may be, and you're sending things into the air, so the, the virus, which is in the rodent feces, okay, deer mice are prominently the, the rodent that carries this. If that's in the air and you breathe it in, it will get into your lungs and it just starts to create this immune response. Again, your body's trying to attack it, make sure that you're safe, but by doing that, the lungs become very swelled. If you scratch yourself, you'll notice how it gets red and swelled and a little bit sore. Imagine that on the inside of your lungs, okay? As your lungs swell and get tight, you can no longer um, breathe. That, that's taking away that area that you would actually use for gas exchange. So hantavirus can be very, very serious. Like hantavirus or, or rodent feces and urine being spread in the air and dust, this is actually asbestos. So when I say down in the bottom, you'll notice that it actually says 50 micrometers. That's extremely small. So from the, my knowledge, asbestos is fine as long as it's intact. It's the movement of asbestos that puts it airborne. And these things are very needle-like, okay? Asbestos is one of the scarier ones to me because once this actually gets into your airway, asbestos needles and fibers are so small as it enters the cell, because as you breathe it in, will like go into your long line, it will enter the cell. It can actually change your internal DNA. So that's microscopically small. It can actually change your, micro, your DNA inside your lungs. The way asbestos actually affects your lungs is the lining of the lungs, okay? So you guys have probably heard of mesothelioma, which is the actual cancer of the lining of the lungs. And it causes this plaque formation, which it makes it extremely hard to breathe, number one, and it takes away the surface area where gas would enter and leave. And of course, well, cancer. So again, back to the proper PPE and proper mask wearing. Asbestos is quite scary for sure. This is, seems a little bit different. Asbestos, but many other long-term breathing conditions can actually be identified by this disorder. This is called digital clubbing. So if you take a look at the fingertips, they actually become quite bulbous and they're usually very pink and warm to touch. There's a lot more blood there. This is indicative of long-term uh, decreasing your blood oxygen levels. So again, minus the, all the coughing and the mucus and stuff that we talked about earlier, this can also be a predominant indicator that there's something wrong. And it's usually, when I think of construction, it is something that is linked to asbestosis. 
Okay, so that's a lot of the information. Uh, now I want to take some uh, some time to actually show you my pig long demo. Uh, as I mentioned, I am a student educator. And I, <clears throat> the SHA was kind enough to let me purchase some pig lungs. And uh, these guys are actually preserved pig lungs. Hopefully the video comes through for you guys. So these are preserved pig lungs. These are healthy lungs. Um, they have been dyed just to make that uh, visual. But these are what healthy lungs would look like. The reason we have pig lungs in the, if bought from an anatomical story is that they are the most recognizable or most similar to adult lungs, okay? This is the closest things we're gonna find to human lungs. It's hooked up to my ventilator right here, okay? This is what we call a transport ventilator. If I have to move someone from the intensive care unit to various testing areas or emergency, this would be the ventilator I would use. The green guy there is a filter, and we are now putting breath into that pig lung and letting it exhale. So you can actually see how the elasticity is just shrinking. Okay, so I push the air in, and it relaxes, and you can hear the air come back out. I hopefully you can hear it come back out. So this guy lives in my office in a little little container with its formaldehyde. I'll just move to the next slide here. So I haven't taken it out in a year. So I thought this was quite interesting. Before I start it, uh, let me just show you, like this area over here is actually all air, okay? Air is entering the lungs. And this area here would be, would be called consolidation or collapsed lung, okay? So this is, as I start this, we'll see the air actually enter in and all these little small alveoli that I showed you at the very beginning will start to actually inflate. So this is collapsed lung receiving aeration. So if you've ever had surgery before and you're giving one of these little guys to make, make the ball go to the top, you really have to suck in on that and make the ball go up. This is what we're trying to prevent because collapsed lung, like the guy here on the left here, is, is, is totally collapsed. And this is what can lead to hospital pneumonia. You go into a hospital for surgery and you come out with pneumonia. How does that happen? Well, this is how it happens. If you have abdominal surgery, you may not want to take a big breath because it hurts, but you actually do need to take a big, a big breath to get that lung nice and open, uh, because if not, it's going to start to collapse like that. Uh, depending on the stress of your day, you probably quite often already take nice, big breaths. Uh, we often sigh. Uh, if you have kids, you sigh a lot, <laughs> and this is going to keep your lungs open. Okay, so I wanted to do a, a little walk around with this lung so you get a better picture. Here they are now fully inflated. They were hooked up to my ventilator for about half an hour. You can still see a little small bit of collapse right there. But as we take it around to the back of the lung, okay, so we have two lungs here. These ear flaps that you see are not typical in adult lungs, okay? So that's a little bit different with the pigs. But you can actually see the vessels right here, okay? So this is where the heart would connect up. So this is where our arteries and our blood veins would actually collect blood and give blood to the lungs in order to pick up oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide. So as I demonstrate there with my fist, this is where the heart would typically live, okay? So it's gonna be pumping blood to the lungs and to the body. Here is a simulated puncture of the lung. So air would be actually squeezing out there along with blood. But again, the overall lung itself is quite healthy. If I, uh, if I actually squeeze the tissue of the lung over here, I'll squeeze the air out of it causing a collapse. And then on the next breath, you'll actually see the entire lung just fill itself back up. So the tissue is nice and spongy, very healthy lung. Nothing wrong with that lung whatsoever.
My next slide. The not so healthy lung. So again, this is a pig lung. Um, it's actually been simulated to look like and act like a smoker who's been smoking one pack a day for 20 years. So my understanding of it, once the, the pig was actually euthanized, the lungs were taken and actually hooked up to a high speed breathing machine where smoke was literally pumped into these lungs to equate 20 year smoking history. We actually have math to do that. And the math is very simple. <clears throat> One pack a day for 20 years is called a 20 year pack history. 20 year pack history could also be two packs a day for 10 years. Two times 10 still equals 20. It could be four packs a day for five years. It's still considered a 20 pack year history. So it's not just the fact that you smoke, it's gonna be what you smoke, it's gonna be at the amount you smoke as well. Let's take a closer look at this lung as well. So compare it to the healthy lung that we looked at. One, slide, one side of this lung is inflating very, well, I don't make sure that's not quite the word. We do certainly collapse and looking up here. Something isn't working here. But look here, this area is not moving whatsoever, okay? Absolutely no air movement whatsoever in here. So as we get to closer expansion right here, get in there and take a look. One of them is my thumb is not internal. Aeration at the top of the lung. There we go. We pop that open. But right here, there's no air getting to the bottom of the lung because this lung is here. Now, again, that wasn't, that is simulated, okay? Again, to get the idea, this entire lung area is no longer receiving air because we actually have an internal nodule in the airway. If you listen closely, I'll show you where the heart lives. You can actually hear air leaking out. Okay, so the heart would actually live in those areas again. Those are the veins and the vessels that we would have to be concerned about. And this is where the heart would live again. If I go over here to the side, I'm gonna show you an external cancerous nodule right here. So again, I showed you just how soft and, and fluffy, so spongy that the, the lung tissue is. This little white nodule here is quite hard. So this would be a cancerous nodule. Surgically, this one would be easier to remove because it's actually external, as opposed to the first one I showed you, which was internal, which would be absolutely horrible to remove or treat. And just watch the way that the air is leaking around there. So the more air that's leaking at the surface of the lung, it's actually not doing gas exchange. We actually don't have any air going into the blood. So it's not really working appropriately. If I take you to the front of the lung, I think it'll be like about five seconds from here. I'm gonna take you back to the front of the lung. You'll see that air is coming out of the lung and actually into the internal lining. And if I'm getting air at the internal lining, that means again, it's not on the inside where it should be meeting the blood. It's actually coming right to the surface of the lung because the, the smoke inhalation has deteriorated that tissue so much. So to conclude with this part, basically let's just take a look at both of these for a minute and see like, where lungs do you, what do you think is working inside of you and which one do you think is gonna be hanging around the longest? Which one is gonna see its grandkids, its great grandkids, okay? Something to think about. Sometimes a visual is enough to, to make you, make remind you to, I actually need to wear my PPE a little bit more diligently than I have. Maybe I shouldn't buy that pack of smokes today, whatever the case may be. 
Well, guys, that's pretty much it. That's all I have. Um, this is Respiratory Therapy Week in Canada. Yay, RT. So we do great work. Uh, COVID has actually put us in the limelight. We're, we're pretty good at what we do. Um, if you have any questions about what RTs actually do, you can look up the Saskatchewan College of RTs. Uh, there's some information on there, as well as our national association, which is the Canadian Society of Respiratory Therapy. You'll see lots of information there of what we can do and what we offer and how we can help you live a happy, healthy life. And that's all I have. Hey, Sheldon. Can you hear me? I sure can. Right on. Well, thank you very much. That was excellent. Really interesting, those visuals, uh, seeing the difference between the healthy and unhealthy ones uh, really, really sent that point home. So thank you very much. Uh, typically, we go an hour for these webinars. We do have a few questions that have come in. So do you have a little bit of time? We're, we're still with, yeah. within that hour. We'd love to hear. May take us a little bit yeah. of time. We'll, we'll try to keep you to that if you're if you're fine with that. So, um, so the first couple questions here, I actually, I know you said not to use Doctor Google, but I used Google because I wasn't understanding the question and I didn't actually know what they were talking about. Uh, so I'm hoping that you have a little bit more insight on this, but. First question has to do with O2 trainers. Uh, O2 trainers are engineered to increase respiratory or inspiratory muscle endurance and have had claims to train the lungs and body to perform at high levels with less oxygen as well as in some circumstances reducing the effects of asthma. Is there any evidence that these products have any beneficial measurable effect on power or efficiency? Have you had much to um, do with these yeah. or, or, or no? Yeah. No, I, I don't have anything to do with them, but I am familiar with them. Um, yes, they work, but they don't work properly. What you're doing is actually putting a resistance on your breathing. Your body's extremely smart. You're putting resistance on your breathing and your body wants a certain amount of oxygen. So how does it get more oxygen? So number one, you start sucking harder, you're breathing harder. So the resistance training is working, but your body says, this is not optimal. What can I do? Your body will start to actually create more uh, red blood cells. And if you create a lot of red blood cells, your blood gets thick. And now all of a sudden you're prone to blood clots and, and this sort of thing. Ideally, the trainers are used for short term periods. It should never reflect in, in, in creating more red blood cells, but it's to me, there are better ways. Okay. Well, it kind of leads into another question that I had come through here. It's dealing with like right now, through COVID and having to wear masks for as long a period as some people have to, for, for instance, our kids that are going to school and wearing masks throughout the, the course of the day. Is, is there any chance or does that have any negative effect on the lungs in any manner? No, no, no risk associated with that. There's uh, the studies that have been done over the last six months, again, because everybody's concerned, the, the studies that have been done over the last six months, your oxygen levels, your carbon dioxide levels are, are all normal. Uh, about two months ago, we actually had a guy here in Regina run around Wascana Lake with four masks on. And he wore one of the finger clips that actually measured your oxygen levels and his oxygen level didn't change. Now, I know that's not scientific, but it does prove the point that there's absolutely no problem with wearing one mask. He didn't have a problem with wearing four. Okay. Good to hear, because I was actually wondering that just with our kids, <laughs> wearing them as much as they have and sometimes us as well when we're in certain um, situations. Sure. Thank you. Um, another question, this one has to do with training masks. Uh, separate from medical masks or fabric masks, do they help during exercise or are they doing more harm? Yeah, so I guess that's similar to the first question, right? So that's the... That's the why I thought they were kind of connected. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah, I, I, again, I, I don't recommend them. I don't know enough about them to say that they're actually beneficial, but I can certainly see some long-term issues with using them as far as blood production and thickening of the blood, which is never a good idea. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question here. What causes that deep burn in the lungs after extreme bouts of anaerobic exercise? And, and what is the best way to get rid of that feeling? Uh, I think my answer, and again, I'm not really sure, but 
to me would be just the same as any lactic acid burn in your muscle. You keep working your muscles day after day or minute after minute, and all of a sudden you just feel the burn. It could be very, very similar to your lungs, or it actually may be something else that you need to look into, but I, I don't think it's anything other than probably just that lactic acid buildup. Lots yeah. of water flow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've kind of had that at times where you just kind of exert yourself more than you're accustomed to, or if it is regular exercising or training or what, and you get that deep down. If, if that's, yeah. If that's happening outside, depending on the time, time of year, you really could suck in cold air and that can cause some irritation. Right. Ideally your body can heat it up by the time it gets here because of your upper airway. Yeah. But again, if you're really working hard, your body's not getting the chance to heat it up because you're you're sucking in so quick and so fast. Yeah, yeah. And as you said in your presentation, that's to be, I guess, expected during exercise. But if something like that is happening, there's really no uh, reason or nothing that would explain why it's happening, then that could be an issue, I would right. think. But, all right. Um, you kind of referred a little bit to this when you were talking about that guy doing his run around Wascana here, but is there a way to test lung function or capacity at home in a way that is measurable so you could have an idea on whether or not your current training or lifestyle is benefiting or harming your lung function? Not really. No, there's no way to actually measure lung volumes or lung function at home. The only thing that you can buy at home, and again, I, I'm not something I'm promoting, but you can certainly buy the little oxygen clips that go on your finger. Even a lot of the smart watches these days have them built in and they measure the oxygen in your blood, but it doesn't really tell you what's happening with your lungs per se. It just shows you how well your lungs and your blood are matching up. Thank you. Uh, this next one is, uh, I, I guess maybe, you know, since cannabis has been legalized, is marijuana smoke as bad as cigarettes? Yes. It, it's the, the simple answer is yes. Um, if I had to do a direct comparison between cigarettes and, and marijuana, it's the fact that cigarettes have the nicotine, which is the addictive quantity, okay? But as far as lung health, it's the burn. Now, I understand that the burn of the, of the tobacco has a lot of other chemicals into it but it's the burn itself, which can actually cause a lot of internal issues. So, and again, thinking about marijuana, the way I probably thought about it when I was a teenager is that, are you smoking a pack of cigarettes today, which would be 20 cigarettes or 25? Are you smoking 20 or 25 joints a day? So that's the comparison I have to use. And I know that they don't really equate that way, but I equate it for the burn. So it's just the burn factor itself. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay. And, and has there been as many, um, I guess, like with the testing of it or studies done, is it fairly new compared to the cigarettes or has there been uh, long-term studies when it comes to marijuana use? Uh, the the long-term studies to marijuana use are starting to show cardiovascular, so more heart-related stuff, actually. Uh, there's not really showing too much on lungs right now because it's just the burn as far as the lungs go. Mm -hmm. The chemical component does have seemingly having some uh, negative effects on the heart function. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this next question is, is, is going in a different direction. What about sawdust? Can it stay in the lungs for extend, like extended periods of time or do the lungs expel the sawdust over time? Uh, sawdust might be a little tricky because there is varying sizes, right? You know, chips of wood versus the very microscopic dust. I mean, most of this stuff, you're, if you're hydrated appropriately and you don't have anything else wrong with your lungs, your mucus is going to bring that up. You're going to cough it out and, and Bob's your uncle. You should be fine. Um, I really never heard of anybody with any long-term lung effects but it may resemble silicosis if there's enough of it, right? So the amount of dust is certainly going to be detrimental if I think of sawdust correctly. Okay. Again, proper PPE should, should make sure that that doesn't happen anyway. Yeah. And again, maybe it depends on, on the type of sawdust. If, um, 
Yeah, you know, if there's chemicals in the wood, if it's MDF, where there's glues and adhesives that are combined within that wood as well. So, yeah. you know, it's not such, a, such an easy answer. Not, not so yeah. cut and dry. Um, just a, a couple more questions here. And I actually had this one in mind too. Is there any chance of reversing some of the damage you talked about or are lungs permanently damaged? So mm -hmm. I know I've heard with cigarettes, you can kind of reverse some of that with uh, asbestos damage, not as much. Does, right. does it again depend on the type of, of uh, lung damage and, and what caused it? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'll start with cigarettes. Um, smoking cigarettes, the minute you quit smoking, things do start to change inside your lungs. Uh, so if you can go like a week, your, your physiology of your lungs will actually start to change for the better. Uh, if you can quit before the age of 30, by the time you're 70, it may actually be completely reversed. So remember, the body is the body. As things age, it doesn't work as well as it used to. So quitting smoking earlier, not even starting is a better idea. But if you have gone down that path and you want to quit, quit before the age of 30 it is very, very beneficial. And it's never too late to quit, okay? There are potential changes. They may be slow at first, but they will start to get better for sure. You mentioned asbestosis or asbestos inhalation. When it comes to those sorts of things, COPD, once COPD is established, it can't be fixed, it can't be stopped. What we can do then is slow it down, right? So stay away from the irritants, stay away from anything that's gonna make your breathing a little bit more labored or, or working. Um, but unfortunately, once those disease processes are in place, they're there. You can't stop them, but we could slow them down. Yeah, I was wondering if there was any treatment for that. What about, would those individuals be a potential or a possible candidate for a lung transplant? Would that be of any benefit to them? Is that an option or not? Um, you know, I, I don't think I can actually say. The only thing I know about organ donation really is that it's it's very difficult to get lungs. Um, as a nation, we're not fantastic as, as far as signing a good donor card, but uh, it is basically based on priority and uh, there tends to be a, a very long wait list. So don't let that be the thing that you want to rely upon for sure. That's, that's not a good game plan. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, uh, thank you. I do have one more question here. So we talked a little bit about the mask and you said um, th they don't affect the lungs negatively, like as far as what we're wearing in the classrooms or what, or what the kids are. Can a mask have, have negative, and maybe this isn't your area, negative sinus effects. My son has allergies and has had most, or his most extreme and longest lasting symptoms since returning to school and wearing a mask most of the day. Um, that's a really good question. Um, one of my co-workers actually does have seasonal allergies and has asthma and she wears the same mask as I do. And all of a sudden her allergies and her asthma become very, very hyperactive. So she actually had to go through, uh, our purchasing agent at the hospital and she tried three different masks before she found something that did not actually uh, kick up her allergies and stuff. So yeah, it is quite a possibility. Depending on the style of mask, if it's a medical mask, it could potentially be one of those that does set off allergies or asthma. If it's a cloth mask, it may be as simple as, as your laundry detergent. Depending on your laundry detergent that you're using to clean your mask, if it's a reusable one, that could certainly be an issue also. Yeah, right. Makes sense. Excellent. Well, that takes us to the end of our questions here, and I guess to the end of our webinar here today. So again, I uh, really appreciate the time that you had to uh, put this presentation together for us. Very interesting. I learned a lot, and I'm sure those that are watching today have learned a lot as well. Again, thank Good you so much for, take, for taking your time with us today here, Sheldon. Yeah, thanks for having me.